Um, Charles Ford is here. His book is The Life and Times, Mordecai. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's won a ton of awards, too. Congratulations. It's done all right. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. it's done all right. Uh, Dave was just saying during the break that we were at the Walk of Fame when he received a, a star acknowledging all of the phenomenal work he, he did, and his wife uh, accepted it on his behalf. A great love story, phenomenal love story, and you had her full participation for this. I correct? did. I had her cooperation, and, I, and it was fundamental to the success of the book. So was the love story. It was my editor who said, you know, you have a great love story here. And being a guy, I hadn't noticed that. I mean, I knew, th I knew that they had this long, happy marriage. I knew it had been really important to him, beneficial to him. But it was my editor who said, pay attention to the love story. So I did. And Florence and I talked for four years about their life lives together so she was a tremendous asset he, could he have been the man he was without her he, he was the man he was without her in the sense that I, he was there from childhood that that fierce identity that fierce personality was there I w certainly would make the case that she made him a better man mm -hmm. she allowed him to be more content and more happy as an adult I think he was making he was heading towards being one of those sort of rather unappeasable dyspeptic men yes. and Florence was such a calming influence such a positive influence so he got lucky why did you want to write a book on, on Mordecai Richler? What was it that about the man, about the writer that attracted you originally? Because you spent four years of your life on I this. I did. I did. He was the Canadian writer that mattered the most to me. I would await the publication of his books. Mm -hmm. I also was living in Montreal during the period when he was engaging with Quebec nationalism in that very, very fierce public way. So for a younger writer like me, and he was stratospheric, I only knew him just to say hello, here was this 60-something novelist who could have been at home having said, you know, younger people can carry on the fight, and he was out there, and he was arguing, he was publishing articles, and he was passionate. And for me, this was a real model of an engaged author. Mm -hmm. So that's why I wanted to write about him. You did meet him a few times. Just socially. He was a quiet man in public. He was very supportive of younger writers. He'd always have a nice word to say to you. But he was naturally reticent, and by no means did I know him. I had to f discover him writing the book. How much did his uh, travels inspire his writing? Because he, well, Barney's version, the, the, the book and the film, are loosely based on his life, correct? And you see yes, the love story. You do. You see how he's traveled through Europe and that sort of thing. Did, did that sort of, how much did that enter into his writing? Well, it's interesting. It, it, it entered into, it formed him as a writer. He spent more than 20 years in London. He spent these formative, almost cliched, louche early years in Paris, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, as a novelist, he by and large stuck very close to Montreal and stuck very close to his Montreal. So even though he was an, a cosmopolitan man with an international sensibility as a novelist, he really was a homeboy when it came to his fiction. You're a writer writing about a writer. A writer writing about a writer, yes. Did, did that, uh, did that uh, teach you a little bit about your own craft? It certainly did, yes. If you spend that much time with someone else, and as I said to you before, it's like you spend years in a room writing about someone who spends, spent years in a room doing the same thing, producing books. Uh, you, you come to admire, you come to recognize the discipline, you come to recognize the tenacity, you come to recognize the pathology, if you will, of being a writer, and you realize what goes into making a major book. And I think my, my biography, Richard, is quite attentive mm -hmm. to what goes into producing a major book, because it's not easy. Well, that's what I was going to say. Everything I've ever read about the writing process uh, speaks to it being very painful, like you're almost giving you know, birth to these words. Did you feel that way writing this book, and, and did you find that that was uh, Mordecai's process as well? It was not painful for me. It was a joy. It was overwhelming. Each and every day I spent eight, ten hours working on that book. And I would go home and sort of completely befuddled. Then I would start again the next morning. He experienced more difficulty writing as a major book. So that was very humbling. He was a very, very productive writer. Mm -hmm. We all read his columns, his magazine articles. But those major novels, the final four books, each of them took almost ten years of his life to produce. So they were spaced that way. And he did not find it easy writing fiction because he set his own, the standards were very high and he wanted to produce something different each time. So it took a long time. You had access to a lot of material previously that we haven't seen mm -hmm. before, restricted material. Uh, it are there some things in particular that stand out that you learned about him through that? The process of, of writing the book was the process of discovering the private man. I only knew that public man we all knew. Uh, abrasive, strong, slightly intimidating, funny, corrosive, a little bit even impolite sometimes in public. The private man, I discovered, was the father, the husband, the son. All those things we all are away from whatever we do in public. And that was a very different man. He was tender, he was sweet, he was caring. And it was really interesting uh, to, to come to that 
to come to that character. And I did that via my access to some of these letters that nobody had seen, and certainly via my conversations with Florence mm -hmm. and other uh, of his friends. I talked to more than 100 of his closest friends and colleagues, and I tried to talk to some of his enemies, though they were less forthcoming. <laughs> what makes Richler so important? Is it, is it actually his writing, and by that I mean his style, it, mm -hmm. was that it as an artist, or was it the fact that he was such a rabble-rouser and pushed the envelope and questioned things around him? Yes. Which part of him, or is it both together? Uh, I that do think it's both. I do think it's both. I think he was a singular presence in Canada. Yeah. I think we forget how different he was. His character was not terribly Canadian. It was outsized. It was big. It was risk-taking. It was provocative. He was not a compromiser. He did not believe in comp. So all those qualities we associate with our character, politeness, compromise, mm -hmm. rational, reason, he was not that way. And we loved that about him. We loved, hated that about him. We always paid attention to him. But in the end, it's the novels that are going to, to be his testament. It's the novels that are going to be his legacy. And one of the pleasures of having published this book in conjunction with the film of Barney's version is that I think people are reading him again. And that's ten years after his what, death. What's that's your favorite a, Richler book? My favorite is Solomon Gursky was here. Mm -hmm. His second to last book. It's a big, sprawling, extraordinary work. The people's choice right now is definitely Barney's version. Barney's version. i got to tell you, one of mine, too, is uh, Jacob Tutu. Oh, of course. You yeah. know, the fact you, go, yeah, you yeah. forget too that he yeah. did children's work, and that, as as a kid, I absolutely it so engaged me, and it yes. just my imagination was just opened up with that book. I think most Canadians now uh, know him because they read him as a kid. Mm -hmm. The Jacob books, Jacob Tutu books. I can't get over how many interviews start with, "Oh, I love Jacob Tutu." Yeah. yeah. Because, because of course his you know his heyday as a novelist was, was a long twenty years ago, if you will. But there have now been three generations of Canadians who've been who were raised on those books. Is there anyone like him now? Is there anyone following in his footsteps in that same sort of brash way? People are trying. Very few can combine the moral authority that came with him being a major novelist with with the outspokenness and risk taking as a journalist. So you'll get people who will want to be the rabble rousers, who'll run a shake, mm -hmm. and they can have a they can be very provocative. Rex Murphy's a provocative commentator, you know. Uh, Rick Mercer's a provocative commentator, but what Richler brought was that force of him being a major serious literary novelist. And no, there hasn't been anybody like him since. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's such an interesting story and of not just a Canadian, but of a phenomenal artist. Yes, and just a, a singular person. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. The Life and Times, Mordecai Charles Foran. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Great talking to you.